We don't know about much about this man, but I want us to look this morning at Simeon's song. Be turning in your Bible to Luke chapter 2. You know, this week, above all weeks, we're anticipating and waiting and thinking about Christmas. On Friday was our last day of school, and I always make it uh, my intent to be in the hallways during when that last bell rings and the, the children are, are getting out of school, and you hear the shouts and the cheers, and then the children express their excitement as well. <clears throat> But the children were all ready. There's an in anticipation. They were excited, and they've been waiting. So for those school children, there's a two-part wait. They're waiting for that last day of school, and then they're out for Christmas. But now begins the second wait, and you parents have to live with that one at home. <laughs> It's the waiting of Christmas Day. Children are always so excited about Christmas, but not just children. Adults are as well. But we're waiting for next Sunday. We're waiting for Christmas Day. Let me ask you something. How do you wait for Christmas? Simeon and his wife Anna had been waiting. I want to continue this series, the next to the last sermon from the first Christmas playlist. This morning, we're going to look at Simeon's song from Luke chapter 2. But let me start by giving you a little background. We'll be looking at verse 25 through 35 in just a moment. But you know, there's some verses before that. When we look at verse 21, there's some things that we need to be noticing uh, before that. Let me, let me read those verses to you, beginning in verse 21. When the eight days were completed for circumcision, he was named Jesus the name given by the angel before he was conceived. And when the days of their purification according to the law of Moses were finished, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, just as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male will be dedicated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Let me give you a little background here as we approach verse 25 where we'll spend the majority of our time. But the birth of Christ had already taken place. Jesus is alive and is born. The shepherds have returned. The wise men have returned. Jesus now has been circumcised on the eighth day. Mary was recovering from the birth. Now it was time for several ceremonial events to take place. In verse 21, we see that at eight years old, Jesus was circumcised. This, as Donald Barnhouse would say, was his first suffering for us as he was circumcised on the eighth day. And then it says he was officially named Jesus. Now you say, well, he was already named. Well, pretty much, because in Matthew 1, 21 we see, and she shall bring forth the Son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. But now the official process is done. I would liken it today as when, when you have a child today, the, the, uh, the people that are caring for that child at the hospital, they'll ask you, what are you going to name the child? And there they put, they give a certificate of birth from the hospital and they put it inside the little bassinet to know what the name is called. I've even been in hospital rooms where they just say baby Crowder because the parents hadn't decided on a name yet. But at a certain point, there has to be a name decided, and you're giving an official birth certificate. The court will, uh, or the courthouse will, will officially take that name that the parents have, have chosen, and the name will be officially received as our name. All of us have that. All of us are supposed to have a birth certificate. This is the same process. The baby had already been named Jesus, but now uh, Joseph and Mary are bringing that baby to be officially named Jesus. The process made the name official. About 40 days years old, we get to verse 23. Mary and Joseph are now bringing Jesus to Jerusalem to dedicate him at the temple. When we get to verse 24 that we just read, Mary and Joseph offer a sacrifice offering to the temple in Jerusalem. All this was ceremonial. Then they offered two turtle doves. We find that in the Old Testament, Leviticus 12. 
Now, for these two, the first thing that we know why they brought two turtle doves, that shows the economic status that Mary and Joseph were. This was a poor person's offering. To offer two turtle doves as a sacrificial offering would show their economic status. They were poor people. It also tells us again the type family that Jesus was born into. He was born into a family that had nothing. You've heard the story over and over and over. Born in a manger, in a cattle stall there in Bethlehem. He was born to a low-income family. But both of these events... The, the ceremonial offering and the sacrifice and, and the circumcision and then the offering of the child, all these were ceremonial according to the law. So it, it, it bears looking at here and, and making a note to ourselves. Events. The, the ceremonial offering and the sacrifice and, and the circumcision and then the offering of the child, all these were ceremonial according to to the law. So it, it, it bears looking at here and, and making a note to ourselves. Even Mary and Joseph obeyed the law. Listen, they had the ultimate sacrifice of all time. They had the greatest sacrifice in their arms. So some would say, Mary and Joseph shouldn't have to bring an offering to the temple. They bear the very child of God. But Mary and Joseph said, we're still going to bring our offering you know, we can't take ourselves away from anything that the Bible commands. And so Mary and Joseph following through with what would be expected then. But now we get to verse 25, and we see the introduction of a man named Simeon. Let's look there in verse 25 through verse 28. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout looking forward to Israel's consolation, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple complex. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to perform for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him up in his arms and praised God and said, and we'll stop right there, for this moment. There's four things I want to teach you about Simeon this morning, and Simeon's song we'll also look at. But number one, let's simply look at Simeon's life. Simeon's life. This is the only time in Scripture that we're introduced to Simeon. The only time. We don't know anything about him. He's not talked about later in, in the Scriptures. But he was a part of the Jewish remnant who were waiting for the Messiah Simeon was waiting to die. But see, God had told him several things. We're going to look at just a moment. But tradition says that Simeon was an old man. Most scholars speculate that Simeon was around 113 years old. Now, to be honest, that's only speculation. And from history, we, we try to grasp that, not specifically from the Bible. Historians who, are, who have written about the times and lives of people at that age. Well, we figure him to be an old man. But the thing I want you to see this morning about Simeon's life, the Bible says he was a righteous and devout man. Look at verse 25. This man was righteous and devout. Then it says twice in these verses that the Holy Spirit was on him. And then later we see he was guided by the Spirit. This was a Holy Spirit-filled man. What a great testimony he has. He said he was devout and he was righteous and filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you what. When you come to the last days of your life, what a great testimony it would be that that would be said about us. That we were devout, we were righteous, and filled with the Holy Spirit. I can't think of many better words to say. As I preached the funeral this week of Miss Mary Campbell, I told the crowd, many of you were here, I can't think of a bad thing about Mary Campbell Spence. Now, all of us are sinners, and, and, and all of us have weaknesses and struggles, and she probably had hers too. But I'm going to tell you, there are very few things that you could say negative about that woman. Boy, what a testimony to die with. A righteous, devout man filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, God, help me to be that kind of person. God, help us to be that kind of people. 
But then he said, would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. He was promised that also. But then look at this little phrase in verse 25 that I'm going to explain to you a little bit. It says, looking forward to Israel's consolation. Well, Chris, what does that mean? That means the nation of Israel were, were looking for the Messiah, the hope of the coming Messiah. That's Israel's consolation. Look, Simeon's life was characterized by two words, righteous and devout. What a testimony. As he was looking, looking for the Messiah. So that's his life. Let's now look at Simeon's faith. We see that in verses 27 and 28 that we just read. Now, we can say all the things we want to about Simeon, but I am convinced all the great things we can say about Simeon are characterized because he was filled with the Spirit. I talked to you about that some last week, being filled with the Spirit. But God had revealed to Simeon some things. He had told Simeon some specific things. Let's look at the things that he was told. First of all, he had revealed to Simeon, the Messiah is coming. Now, he didn't just reveal that to Simeon. He had told all the nation at that time that, that the Messiah was coming. Some believed it and some did not. But he was specifically telling Simeon in his heart, the Messiah is coming. And uh, Simeon was having a great work done in his heart because he was filled with the Spirit. But not only is the Spirit coming, I mean, the Messiah coming, that he would not die Simeon would not die until after he had seen the Messiah. And then here's the amazing one, that the boy that was brought to the temple was the Messiah. If you read in those verses, Mary and Joseph then bring the baby to the temple. You know, as I was reading this, the question that first came to my mind, how did Simeon know this was the Christ child? How did he know this was the Messiah? I can tell you why, and there's only one reason. He was filled with the Spirit of God. I'm going to tell you, when you're filled with the Spirit of God, God will show you things. and God will. Re- now, he will not reveal anything to you that's not already in here. This is God's Word. God's breathed Word has already been spoken for all of mankind. But He will lead and guide and direct our lives. So I think the next thing about Simeon in, this, in his faith was he was eagerly watching. He was eagerly watching. Every day he and Anna would come to the temple wondering, is today the day that the Messiah will come? Every day, in verse 25, it says the word yearning and waiting. It says looking forward to Israel's constellation. They were eagerly watching. If you look at that word looking forward to, you get the word yearning and waiting. Listen, that should be us every day of our lives. We should be eagerly, eagerly watching We should be watching for the Messiah. Now, the Messiah has already come the first time, correct? We had the birth of Jesus. But now, we're looking for him in a different way. He came as a baby king. Next time, he's coming as a victorious king. And he's coming back for his church. We should be eagerly watching. But I'm telling you, I'm guilty as you are. There are days when I get up and I'm not thinking, could today be that day? But let me tell you, we should get up every day as Christians thinking, is today the day? Let me tell you, if you're here and you're not a Christian this morning, you've never accepted Jesus Christ, you should almost be living in a fear. Today could be the day. Oh, but you can take care of that this morning. Simeon's faith, he was eagerly watching, but he was actively waiting. Anna and Simeon modeled active waiting by continuing to show up at the temple every day and listening to the Holy Spirit. When I was growing up in Smithfield, I went to a barbershop, Southside Barbershop, right there in downtown Smithfield. Gene and Roy were the barbers. Now, for you old-timers, it was not Gene Autry and Roy Rogers, but it was Gene and Roy. Those were the two barbers. And we would go in, my dad and I, and he would, get, uh, he would go to Roy, and I would go to Gene. But it was an old-fashioned barbershop. 
like a few of them are still uh, uh, today. You would go in and you'd have to wait. And I remember going in after school and waiting and waiting and waiting till it was, till it was our turn. Well, I went to one like that a, a little while as an adult, and I said, you know, I've got to start going somewhere where I can walk in. Now where I go, I just go straight, and I walk in. I know when they're opening doors. Many times I help them unlock the door, and I say, I'm first. I'm ready to go right now because I don't have time to wait with all the things that are going on in my life and in my schedule, I don't have that kind of time to wait. I sit some mornings and study down at the cafe many mornings. And many mornings, there's a group of men who sit at the front table and they just talk for hours on hours. I don't have that luxury right now. One day, I hope I will. <laughs> But they're able to just wait. I even read an article a couple of years ago that says that's part of uh, our society's problem. We don't sit in barbershops and just talk anymore. <laughs> that may be, may be some truth in that. I don't know. But they weren't just sitting there waiting. Simeon and Anna weren't just sitting in the cafe waiting. You know, we need to be actively waiting today. Simeon was just saying, I'm not going to waste my life and sit here and see when the Messiah might show up. They were not sitting around doing nothing. They were continually working at the temple and every day wondering if today was the day. Listen to this. Waiting is not, uh, waiting for God is not laziness. Waiting for God is not going to sleep. Waiting for God is not the abandonment of effort. Waiting for God means activity under command. It means readiness for any new command that might come. And it means the ability to do nothing until a command is given. Simeon, Simeon and Anna were actively waiting. You know what? That's what the church of Jesus Christ has got to be doing today. We have got to be actively waiting. Now, the terms don't seem like they can go together. L let, me, let me illustrate it like this. You're looking for, a, you may be looking for a job, trying, trying to find a, a new job or a different job. And, and you say, well, I, I'm going to just wait. I'm just going to sit here by the phone and wait for it to ring. You know what? It's probably not going to ring. You've got to be actively waiting. You've got to fill out some, some resumes. You've got to go see some potential employers. You've got to get the word out about your area of expertise or your desire to work. Be actively waiting. Then I think the third thing we see, they were intentionally obeying intentionally obeying. Sometimes waiting is not about passive non-action. It's about obedience. Sometimes the only thing, the only thing we can do is wait on God. Well, listen, there's a fine line of not knocking doors down and letting God open the doors for us. Listen, if you've ever been in a time when you're waiting on God, and we all have been, boy, there's a fine line there for me to pray and allow God to do his work and wait on him and not getting ahead of him. But I believe God does not want me to be just sitting back saying, okay, God, whatever you're going to, he intends for me to be actively waiting and intentionally obeying that's Simeon's life, and that's Simeon's faith. Number three, Simeon's praise. Now we get to Simeon's song. Look with me at verse 28. I'll read that short verse along with the rest. Simeon took him up in his arms, praised God, and said, Now, Master, you can dismiss your slave in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it, and in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and glory to your people, Israel. We see now Simeon's praise, or Simeon's song. The, the, the phrase, uh, or the, the song, Simeon's song, many have known it as Simeon's canticle, or in the, the known in, originally in history as the Nuke Demitis. It comes from the first two lines that are written in that, that song in Latin. But it's interesting. His song begins the same way all the others have begun. Simeon took him up in his arms and praised God. 
Every one of these songs that we've looked at have began by praising God. The moment Simeon saw the child, he knew it was the Messiah. And he began to praise God. How? Why? Because the Holy Spirit was in him. There's no other way you can explain it. Simeon immediately burst into song. Verse 28, the pattern that we see begins praising God. He took Jesus into his arms and it became personal. You know, I never forget those moments, the three times in my life when, when we've had our children. And, and there's, there's nothing like when that baby is first born and, and they get him cleaned up a little bit and, and get some, uh, a blanket wrapped around him and putting in the mother's arms at that moment, but way before that for the mom, it's already become personal. But, oh, boy, I remember when, when they put my children in my arm for the first time, it became real personal then. Listen, the same thing happened to Simeon. When they put the Christ child in his arms, it became personal. And Simeon quickly moved from praising straight to prophesying. He began to tell of the things that God would do. He tells God that he can allow him to die now since he's seen the Savior. Simeon was not afraid of death, evidently, because he told God, now, God, you can allow me to die because now I have a relationship with the Savior. Hey, let me ask you a question this morning. Can you say that? Now, I don't think there's anybody in, in, the, in the building would say, boy, I, I'm, I'm ready to die today. Now, we may say, I'm prepared to die. But can you say that this morning, that you're prepared to die? Simeon said, God, you can take me now. Prophecy has been fulfilled. And what you have told me, I would not die until I see the Messiah. Now I've seen him, Lord, at any moment. I'm ready because I have a relationship with the Savior, and I've now seen him. He knew that death would only be physical because of the Messiah. He would never die spiritually. He would live forever. Simeon had seen God's salvation in the flesh. But the Messiah didn't just come for Simeon. Aren't you thankful that he came for all mankind, for all of eternity? And Simeon makes mention of that. So there we see Simeon's song of praise, that canticle, those four verses as Simeon breaks out in his song of praise and then he begins to prophesy and tells what the Savior would do. But he continues that and we get Simeon's prediction. Or it might be better said, Simeon's prophecy. Look at Luke 2 and verse 33. His father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and told his mother Mary, Indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed. And a sword will pierce your own soul that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Simeon's prediction. Simeon blessed the child. He looked at Mary and Joseph and he offered his blessing upon this child. Then the scripture records for us. Luke says, then he has some words for Mary. It's interesting. Joseph is standing right there. Most scholars would agree that Joseph was dead during the time of Jesus' adult life and during the time of his earthly ministry. Joseph is not seen during those days, so it's pretty much understood that Joseph was not alive during that. Remember the death of Jesus on the cross? It was Mary who was there. And now these words are going to Mary. Mary would be the one to see the signs. And it would be her soul that was, the scripture says, pierced by the sword. But I think there's three things here that we can see in this. There's the Savior. Verse 30, a Savior for all mankind, to all the peoples, to the Jews and the Gentiles. But aren't you thankful that it was for all of mankind for all of eternity? You know who that includes? That includes me and you. And Simeon is telling Mary and Joseph, he said, it's going to be a savior to all of mankind, but then also there are going to be signs. What's a sign? A sign is a revelation of divine authority. Jesus would prove for the world that he was the Messiah by the signs and miracles that he would do. The next 33 years of his life, 
and specifically those last three and a half years as he began his earthly ministry. He did signs and wonders and miracles. And, and Simeon was telling him, there's going to be great signs. But he's also saying, there's going to be negative signs in that phrase, a sign that will be opposed. This child would face hostility, would face slander, would face cruelty, would face torture, and eventually death. And Simeon saying to Mary, these are going to be the signs that the sword is going to pierce your heart. You know, I've said many times, I can't hardly talk about the birth of Jesus without talking about the death of Jesus. The two are so tightly knit because Jesus was born to die. You know what? So are we. So are we. We are born to die. Now, Jesus is born to die was quite a bit different than yours and I, yours and mine. But we're all born to die. But then it says this sword, and this phrase is specifically, commentators say, intended for Mary's ears during the life of Jesus. She would face huge mountains of sorrow and pain as she watched her son in the ultimate pain on the cross. Hey, let me ask you, you think Mary understood all of this at that time? You know, I, I, don't, I don't think she did understand all of it because she was human. And she was being told this. She was told by the angels. Now she's being told by Simeon. I believe she's being told by God in her heart. But I don't know that she could understand it all. But here's what we do know. The Bible says we know that Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. I think Mary was filing these things. But Simeon said this is going to be the sword that pierces your heart. The Savior. Any of you have had children know that there's moments when what they do is piercing. You know, and the older I get, and, and I even tell my children this sometimes I, when I'm trying to instruct them and tell them something or something that we disagree on or something that their mom and I are trying to teach them, I'll even say, you can't understand this right now, but one day you will. Y'all out there? Are you there? If you got, ever had a teenager, you've been there. <laughs> But there are moments and times where my children can't understand yet, but one day they will. One day they'll experience the love that only a parent can have for a child. In 2010, Drew Brees was a quarterback for the New Orleans Saints. New Orleans Saints won their Super Bowl that year. After the Super Bowl was on, I mean, over, the, the confetti was coming down on the field and, and, and the music was playing and the celebration was on, the New Orleans Saints had won the Super Bowl. But the picture that went viral and was on the front page or the front cover of Sports Illustrated, and I wish the power had not gone out, and, and I had that picture for you. But it's of Drew Brees, that quarterback that led his team to the Super Bowl, his, his child who I believe has some physical challenges. He had that young boy held up like this, and that was on the front cover of Sports Illustrated. The reporter said, Brees, what were you saying to your child. He said, I stood there with my little boy. He said, and I was overwhelmed. He said, I told Balin how much I loved him and how much he meant to me and what an inspiration he was to his daddy. I thought of my mom, Breeze said, who I believe was smiling on us from heaven and all my family and friends who were watching. And I told my little boy who didn't even understand what's going on as I held him up like this. And the picture of Drew Breeze holding that baby and his wife standing right beside him and all the confetti is coming down. He told his little boy, we did it. We did it, little boy. We did it. Can you imagine Simeon as he took the Christ child? 
He bore him in his arms and held him up and said, God, you did it. You did it. The Messiah has come. What I've been actively waiting for, what I've been watching for, what I've been anticipating, what I've been yearning for, what I've been looking for, God, you have done it. But not just now, forevermore. You have done it. The child is here. Simeon's song, I'm about to sing it, God, praise to you. You can take me now because you did it. The child is here. But you know what? One day around the throne of God, 33 and a half years later, the angels of heaven begin to get restless. And when Jesus died on the cross, he went to the grave for three days. And then that miraculous day when he rose again, I believe maybe the angels of heaven, as they received him back into heaven, held Jesus before the Father and said again, you did it. You did it. You've proven to the world that the Messiah is more powerful than anything. You did it. How about you this morning? Do you believe that Jesus did it? Because he can do it in your life today. You can see his salvation as Simeon said today. The real question is this this morning. What are you waiting for? Or a better question to us believers, what are you doing as you wait how are you waiting? Simeon told God that he can allow him to die since he has now seen the Messiah. Can you make that statement today? Can I make that statement? Can you stand before God and say right now, God, you can take me now because I'm ready if you so call me. Let me tell you what, as I said three times this week to crowds of people in funerals, it's the greatest gift you can receive, the salvation of Jesus Christ but it's also the greatest gift you can give. As I sat in that living room, in that dining room this week with the Spence family, as I sat there and I, I listened to them talk to me and tell me things, I said, wait a minute. I said, the greatest gift your mother ever gave you was telling you about Jesus and salvation. That's the greatest gift she ever gave you. Greater than your birth was your spiritual birth. And your mama told you about that. I said, but guys, the second greatest gift you have experienced today that she's given you, that you know where she is. I'm working on a message. I don't know when I'm going to preach it, but I'm working on it. How to die well. How to die well. Simeon said, I'm ready. So let me ask you this morning. Do you have Simeon's faith? Are you eagerly watching, actively waiting, and intentionally obeying, obeying? Or let me ask you this. Are you just passively sitting? I am reminded almost every week that life is but a vapor. You don't believe that? Get your newspaper every day and go to the obituaries. Are you ready like Simeon was? Simeon said, I'm ready, Father. I have fulfilled, I mean, you have fulfilled what I've been waiting for. I've seen the Messiah. I'm ready. On your beck and call. Are you ready for that today? Will you bow with me as we pray?